Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Safety and Risk Success podcast with me, Christian Harris. My guest today is Diane Chadwick-Jones, and we talk about human and organisational performance, or HOP for short. So the title of the episode is HOP, not HOPE, uh, and you'll see why that is when you get into the conversation. Um, really enjoyed talking with Diane. Um, she uh, retired from BP a couple of years ago, uh, but had forged a really successful and long uh, career there, starting in operations and ending up um, overseeing kind of safety culture and this whole piece around um, HOP uh, as well. So we talk about what HOP is, why it's important, um, how it's relevant to, to us all and what we can do to implement this. Um, we talk as well about a lot of um, other aspects of safety and risk. So really interesting piece around leading versus lagging indicators uh, and also um, how you should or shouldn't, and I won't spoil the discussion, uh, incentivize um, managers uh, around safety uh, and KPIs and how that all works. So really, really interesting conversation. And what I would say is this conversation definitely changed the way that I think um, about certain aspects of safety and risk. And that to me is what doing this podcast is all about. Um, trying to obviously create some some good content, um, but my view is, you know, if I'm learning and uh, developing, then hopefully everyone else in the audience is as well. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with myself and Diane. And without further ado, let's join it now. Cheers. Welcome to the Safety and Risk Success Podcast with Christian Harris. We believe that proactive safety and risk management powers business performance. Each week, we explore this theme, sharing guests, stories, insights, trends, hints, and tips. You can find us on all the major podcasting platforms, and video versions are available on YouTube. But for now, let's join the conversation with Christian. Welcome to the podcast, Diane. Well, thank you, Christian. It's great to be speaking with you today. Yes, thank you for sharing some time. Um, I thought it might be a good idea just to start by giving um, the, anybody in the audience that isn't aware of it an overview of HOP and what it what it stands for and what it means and what are the principles of it. Well, thank you, Christian. So it, human and organisational performance, what are we talking about? Well, we're actually talking about how people are part or just one component um, of a multi-component workplace and what that means is that when things don't go to plan rather than looking at the individual and saying oh well, they made a mistake or they were careless or they weren't paying attention instead we say oh well the person is just one part of this multi-component workplace which means that we have to look at what influenced them was it that the procedures were unclear? What, did they have enough resourcing? Was the equipment properly maintained? Was it easy to use? And so this takes us to a much deeper place of understanding risk. Because if we just say, well, tell people, follow the rules or you'll be punished and things keep on going wrong, well, then well, where, where are you left? You're left with sacking people mm. and you get other people and they do exactly the same things. They miss that step in the procedure or they reverse the truck and hit um, the, the wall. All these things. You, you wonder why is it that people keep on doing these wrong things? Well, maybe it's because the procedure has is it's 25 steps long and that uh, people could miss the step or maybe with the truck uh, that recently a longer um, length of truck has been ordered by the company and the drivers haven't been trained to reverse the longer trucks into into the yard mm -hmm. so it makes a huge difference at the hop approach makes a huge difference at how we see risk and how we what we do when we when we're when things go wrong not only that but it actually makes us look at everyday work what are the good catches what are the workarounds in everyday work that could eventually lead to an incident mm -hmm. rather than saying oh well we're going to train those people up and we're going to tell them to do the right thing and then hope for the best yeah yeah hop not hope <laughs> 
<laughs> loving that hop note hope yeah exactly hope uh, you know hope is not a strategy that works no, no. um there we go we've got a, we've got a good title for the episode now hop not hope that'll, that'll yeah. put some put a cat amongst the pigeons yeah. um so it's all about context then isn't it a lot of a lot of it's around context and really understanding what's going on uh, and, and accepting that things can go wrong and but learning from those and improving over time and having that kind of continuous improvement mindset well here's the issue that every day when things go wrong we just look at the most immediate cause of it mm. and it looks like the person like the person has done something wrong so you're absolutely right Kristen it's about looking at the context but yet every day just looking on the surface of things we jump to blame mm. and we never look at the context or rarely look at the context so what the the kind of under underpinning fundamental of hop is to build awareness in senior leadership about that context drives behavior and that the workers are only one component of of, of a multi-component workplace mm. and that then their actions when things don't go to plan or when there's near misses that their actions have a huge influence in this so if if leaders when something goes wrong and it looks as if somebody hasn't paid attention just for sake, for sake of argument that yeah. oh they've they've been uh, drilling um uh, uh into a ground uh for a pipe laying and uh they hit a um a, a, a pipe let's just say for example the, the senior leaders would go oh my god you know why can't we get good people you know what why weren't they paying attention they should have had all the the design drawings they should have done all this but actually we know that nobody comes to work to get involved in an accident no. and that the people who were who were involved in this incident that they were doing what anybody else would have done under the circumstances if instead the senior leaders respond in a supportive way to bad news saying okay we know we've got good people they must have been in a difficult situation let's find out what's going on let's look into this in more detail and then what they find is that the planning drawings were out of date that in fact the the, the procurement had set up the contract so that they, they were being paid by miles of pipe and with a lot of pressure on time rather than the number of checks that there were in terms of drilling exploratory boreholes looking for um, other pipes and electrical cables and and so you, these these kind of the questions that senior leaders ask um, about what made sense to people uh, at the time and the context that they were working under is incredibly powerful mm. in terms of the making the hop approach happen in a company yeah and, and you came from a from an operational background and then moved into kind of safety and, and safety culture and, and looking at, at, at the hop approach and i guess you must also then see that i mean it goes back to the saying of good safety is good business but to me it sounds like if you can embed this approach it's going to have all sorts of other benefits not just on safety and, and ensuring people go home safely at the end of the day well, it does actually have uh, a difference in, in terms of productivity. So I did do a study on this, and um, which is published in Safety Science, uh, which uh, surveyed 50 sites in BP mm -hmm. um, on the level of em embedment of, of this approach. And what we found was the places that had the, the leaders listening and building trust not only did they have less injuries, not only did they have less spills, but they also had a much higher level of productivity and throughput. Mm. So and that was the first study that's ever shown that. Um, that was, I think, published in 2018 and I can provide it. Um, but it, it's yeah. quite a big 
shift to understand, although many companies, when I would speak to the peer companies of BP, they would say, oh, well, yes, we understand that, you know, the, the more that leaders respond supportively to bad news and listen and fix things, well, the, the less incidents that we have and the more productivity that we have. Uh, and of course, um, many companies find that there is this culture of blame and culture of fear. And when you reduce that, it means that you find out much more quickly about the things that are getting in the way of effectiveness. And you have to, uh, something that Paul O'Neill said to me once, um, the very same attention to detail that you have in safety also gives you effectiveness and efficiency. Mm. Because what you're doing is you're problem solving, you're looking for those weaknesses, that, those risks, and you're fixing them. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know you'd, you, you'd um, spoken with uh, Paul O'Neill. Uh, he would, I, I'd have loved to have had him on the podcast, but obviously that's not possible now. But um, he, he was a pretty inspirational guy. He was, a, a, well, he, he made such a difference to Alcoa, but also he was very generous with his time mm. um, helping other companies. And he was very helpful to BP. Um, we were redesigning our uh, values and behaviors. Mm. And um, he sp spoke with people in BP so that we could learn from the Alcoa experience of how when you lead through the core value of safety, that it, that it brings you many other benefits yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Because when you talk about this and you sort of set it all out like that, it just makes perfect, or to me anyway, perfect logical sense. And you think, well, what's the alternative or what, what else are people doing? And, and why is why would people not want to take this approach? Well, unfortunately, I, I see the opposite a lot. Um, I, and I see it through mentoring quite a lot. So I see actually into companies through the eyes of my mentees. And it's incredibly tough when there are leadership teams who, who feel that it's all about the workforce. The mm. workforce are um, difficult and, and doing things that are, that are causing problems. And the leaders try and distance themselves from the safety performance of the company by saying, well, it's nothing to do with us. You know, we're doing everything that we can, but instead all they do is they blame. Mm. And when there are major incidents, the, the level of um, detail in the incident investigations or the focus of the incident investigation is probably the best way to, to, to say this, is on the people doing things wrong. Mm. And I, I find this shocking to think that in 2022, that is where we're at. But unfortunately, um, because the le there are so many levels of hierarchy between senior leaders and the front line, this is unfortunately a, a more common yeah. issue than you could imagine mm. i mean i see i see a lot of disconnect between what the board says about safety or, or what they think is happening and what's re the reality on on the front lines and on the shop floor um but i haven't experienced uh you know much i won't say any but much of that kind of blame in, in companies that i've sort of worked for but yeah um but but you know perhaps i've been um a bit lucky what i have seen is kind of you know very much a siloed approach of of you know w w safety's our number one priority which is a, a saying that i hate from the board <clears throat> but then that's not being backed up with the support and the and the training and the investment and all that kind of stuff at the at the site level and often i think that senior leaders are very well-meaning and and very good people and what that brings me to realize is that data is our friend. Mm. So and I can give you two examples of that. So I think it's a, I can't remember, it's a Norwegian or a, or a Dutch rail company thought that, the, that certain drivers were passing red signals. Okay. And they, this is work of Jop Groneverg. 
And so what they decided to do was to delve into their data, look into this in more in more detail. So who were the drivers who were passing those red signals on two way lines, you know, who were overshooting the signals? Who are those drivers? So they went and did all their analysis and they found that all the drivers were overshooting the signals, that there was no bad apple. Mm -hmm. This is a bad apple fallacy, right? That there were there were no bad apples, that that everybody was doing it. So they went, oh, okay. So it, it's not about finding the drivers who were the, the red signal overshooters uh, and sacking them. Uh, there's something um, here going on about the, the influences because it's happening to everybody. So they realized that there was a, a lot of emphasis on saving fuel mm. and of course a lot of emphasis on schedule um, going to schedule and people the drivers were not actually able to guess whether a light was going to turn red or not and so they were going quite fast towards towards the these lights and that is the reason why they were overshooting them so what they did was they put more signals further up the line to give an indication of when this essential signal on a two-way track would be turning red. And of course, then the level, the number of, of passing the red signals dramatically reduced. Mm. So that, that this kind of data can help a company um, better understand the reality of what their frontline are struggling with. Another example is, is from BP, which is again a published paper um, around just culture, where we redesigned the just culture process to take out the criminal law wording like negligence and mm. reckless and violation. And then over 18 months, we looked at about 350 cases of just culture and found that very few of them, uh, very few of this so-called rule, rule breaking, these were 350 cases that, which would have previously have been seen as rule breaking, mm. that these 350 cases, most of them were to do with unclear procedures or not being able to find the procedure or uh, um, equipment being confusing or not having enough resource or not having the right training um, or being actually trained to do it that particular way, custom and practice, mm. uh, because things had drifted over time. And that data was transformational in the company because it, it, because it, it really showed that people were trying to do the best that they could under the circumstances. So that was very helpful. So I, I think that we, we can talk about senior leaders of, of companies um, behaving in a negative way. But really, if we then say, well, understanding risk and understanding, really understanding the work, difference between work as imagined versus work as done is the key mm. here. And using data around work as imagined versus work as done is incredibly powerful. Hmm. Do you think it's then because perhaps these senior leaders that have this kind of slightly more negative attitude, if that's the right word, um, is it perhaps because they haven't come up through the business and they don't really understand maybe what's what's going on or they're sort of so far removed from it? You know, perhaps it's the, the finance directors become the CEO or something like that, which is obviously a very common occurrence. And and they don't really know what the business does. They just know the thick, the facts and figures. And, and in that world, everything's kind of black or white. Um, is that is that maybe part of the problem? And do we need to be thinking about how we can influence um, or, or, or drive more safety and risk professionals to be trying to get up to that sort of board level and having a risk management director or a safety director, you know, sitting at the right level within uh, within as many companies as possible? I think you've hit the nail on the head there that leaders who have experience of the frontline operations have so much more empathy and understanding of the reality of what is faced day to day. I have seen leaders who didn't have much experience of the frontline just immerse themselves in it. I remember mm. one, uh, somebody I worked for who, who was a, one of the most senior leaders of BP was a lawyer. Mm. 
And what he decided to do was he decided to just spend time offshore. And he actually lived offshore for a month. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, because he wanted to understand what, what it was really like. So I, I, I would ag agree with you that um, often uh, leaders who come from marketing or from finance, finance are, who deeply care about safety, but are less understanding of the day-to-day -day reality, those leaders could be more likely to jump to blame. Mm. And I would also agree that, that a more effort on bringing safety professionals through into the main roles in the lot um, companies is important. Mm. It makes me think of Exxon where there for, for many, many years, their policy was to only have operations people um, moving through into senior leadership in the company, mm. um, operations and safety people. Yeah. And I would say that a number of oil companies have a similar policy yeah. that without ha having had a, a operations role, that it's difficult to move, to progress, because mm. otherwise uh, run, run, people you know, don't understand the reality of risk. And these are high hazard industry companies where, yeah. you know, we're only a spark away from an explosion. Mm. And, and obviously with, with your background in, in that industry, um, as you say, it's high hazard and there have been, you know, well-documented uh, issues in the past and that has driven i guess the industry to be um more conscious than than other industries shall we say around around this and more more focused on it and and walking the walk rather than just sort of talking the talk when you're uh consulting now and, and mentoring i guess you're doing that across different sectors as well are you rather than just in in that particular industry across many sectors so yeah. Um, mining, transportation, pharmaceuticals, um, hmm. engineering. With different, yeah, so there's different sort of, con again, going back to that word of context, there's different contexts around each of those industries, I suppose, uh, in terms of the uh, the sort of safety being a precondition, like Paul O'Neill would, would say, rather than safety being a maybe a bit more of a, a tick box exercise in industries where the catastrophic risk is, is lower. Well, the interesting thing about different sectors is they they still have. So if you don't have safety as your driver, you still have quality as your driver. Yeah. So it 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 that is a big help. And the, and when I think about making change, I think about Cotter's you know, eight stages of change, which you know, after we did all the changes in BP, we realized that's what we'd been following uh, <laughs> without knowing. But there's this thing about the coalition as one of Cotter's eight stages of change. And I would say that the that it doesn't matter what industry you're in. Just think about what's important to your company and then have a coalition between the safety department and let's just say the quality department. Mm. The, the, these are the, the, these are the powerful coalitions that then help bring about the change in the organization. Yeah. And I mean, yes, there are some companies that, that are many, many, well, even decades behind actually, who, who, but, but they're taking steps forward. And that's what I find so encouraging is that now in this human performance approach, or you know, if you're more nerdy, you can call it a systems thinking approach, right? There is so much evidence out there that it's working, that many companies that are stuck in a plateau of safety performance, of, of getting injuries or incidents down to a certain level and then not being able to get, get any further, mm. thinking, oh, okay, this is the thing that's gonna help me break the plateau. Now, of course, 
decades of behavioural based safety wrongly applied has meant that really the, the senior leader, leaders have been trained to go around on red carpet type vi visits and look for people so-called breaking the rules or so-called doing workarounds and then telling them off mm. and asking them to pledge <laughs> i mean how many consultancies out go out, out are still there yeah. doing behavioral based safety saying that the front line are the bad actors here and going around getting them to pledge to work safe for their family and then shaking their hands i mean this is here and now this is happening in this industry and in, in any industry hmm. so the the point that i'm getting to is that there's a critical mass on human and op, uh, organizational performance that that, that co many companies are still behind hmm. and that many consultancies are wondering how do we deal with this because our customers are asking us for a different way of being but yet the senior leadership are still kind of steeped a bit in blame. Oh my goodness, how are we gonna are we gonna sell this? And I see this in major consultancies at the moment, and they're going through a big transition. It's, mm. it's uh, uh, and and they're doing the best they can. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what sort of trends do you see? Uh, you know, driving this this change as well. Um, clearly, there's there's uh, striving to to be better and and to drive performance and all that good stuff, but in terms of societal stuff, particularly in the context of the pandemic, you know, do you think that that has helped us to maybe accelerate this this change a little bit because we've now got a slightly better or, or, or heightened awareness towards risk? Yeah, well, I think there were some interesting things that have happened um, in terms of understanding the reality of what's going on. So, for example, one company, um, did a survey to find out what was going on with people working at home mm. and the way that their work, their um, workplace was set up. And they, they found that there were all these people with back pains and arm pains and RSI, but yet nothing had been reported in the official reporting system. And that was a, a wake up call for this company because they thought, oh, okay, so we, we're, people are being injured um, because they're at working from home and they haven't got quite the right setup, but yet we haven't heard anything about it. Mm. So the, I think the pandemic has, I mean, has been, you know, horrifying and, um, and traumatic time, uh, for everyone. And it has forced us to look at things in a different way. It has forced us in a way for more communication through, um, zoom but at the same time it has also brought maybe a bit more honesty hmm. um or transparency um in companies around the issues that they're facing and i've also noticed that um some companies felt that they were able to focus more on their high hazard operations because they were getting less visits yeah um and less kind of help and interference um, from from places. So although, of course, huge issues with um, equipment procurement mm. and huge issues with maintenance. So you know, they're not to underestimate the, you know, the wide, wide reaching negative effects. I think there's been a bit more um, openness of communication yeah. um, ab about risk mm. because you know, everyone's been in the same boat. Yeah. It's not us and them. It's not you know the leadership um, in their ivory tower and the uh, the workers in their in their in in their factory. Instead, there's you know everybody has been affected by the pandemic, and and talking about mental health issues has also caused by the pandemic has also caused more openness and honesty in companies. Yes, definitely. Um, I think as well, there's this kind of um, the, the, the younger generation, I guess it's fair to say, who are so much more, in my, my view, uh, attuned to causes like the environment and um, 
I think that has an effect on the, the the psyche and the way companies need to operate to to do the right thing and to get that communication going. And they have to bear in mind that you know if they're not if they're not aligned with the philosophies and the desires of those people, they're not going to want to work for them and they're not going to want to buy from them. And and so I think there's that kind of societal shift to to being sort of better, safer, cleaner, greener all that kind of thing, I think really is, is helping as well. Well, I see a, a, a lot of really good activism ha- ha- activism happening within companies where the younger generation are really speaking up and calling out uh, the companies and going, well, you know, well, you know, our purpose, let's just say, for example, a company had a purpose that was set 10 years previously. Mm. Well, we would like to revise this purpose because it might be fine for everybody who's 50 in the company um, but for the generation of people who are between 25 and 35 well we see it a bit differently and what I see is that um, companies are listening to that and that's a Mm. very positive because um, because the challenges that we saw 30 years ago are totally different to the challenges that we're facing in the current day. So I, and it's those companies that adapt are the ones that are, are, are thriving and the ones that are, are not adapting are the ones that are having a pretty tough time. Yeah. I saw something interesting. I may have even mentioned this on the podcast before, but um, I think the, the fortune 500 list of companies in something like 1940, uh, by the time we got to 2010, only about 20 of them were still in the Fortune 500. So it shows you that everything's changing and everything's adapting and, and you've, got to, um, you've got to go along with that, haven't you, in, in many respects, otherwise you're at uh, risk of becoming extinct. Well, that's the reason why this human and organisational p- perspective is so important because it is about, it, and it's almost like HRO, you know, listening to expertise. It is about, or listening to the quietest voice in the room, it is about, listening in the organization to whatever concern there is and then addressing that Mm -hmm. rather than saying you know we're going to do things this way and you're just going to toe the line I think that's you know quite a big shift Mm -hmm. so we're moving from the transactional or autocratic leadership more to the transformational leadership where it's a it's a very much a a co-leadership um, conversation between everybody in the company rather than you know, these figureheads in a company who then kind of push the policies yeah. down the line. So I think that, I think, I think that's a, a very, and there's a lot of work on safety culture um, showing how much, what a big difference transformational leadership makes um, to a company in terms of its uh in terms of its safety mm. and the the weird thing about it is that the the strongest influence is um in terms of how leaders listen so it you know, it's very it, and anybody can look at this because of course companies have uh, annual surveys nobody pays any attention to these annual people attitude surveys but they're a gold mine because in them they've got two or three questions that statistically correlate to safety and to productivity. And those three questions are, you know, I'm able to speak up without um, uh, fear of reprisal. Um, My leader listens to me. Um, And another one is, you know, I feel cared for. Mm. And generally speaking, those standard surveys, and and if a company is doing that and they do it by site, very quickly, you can see that the sites that have the less listening less caring um or and less um open yeah. leadership or people who are going out asking for bad news because it, it's not good enough just to say oh my door is open you have to go around and ask people yeah. you know what's worrying you yeah. uh you know what are you struggling with what's making the work difficult you have to go out yeah. and ask yeah. these things yeah. but those those are the, the you can actually find very quickly which sites are the ones that where the, the leaders need a bit more help mm. to um, to 
to have that more transparent culture. Because remember, what we've been doing for years is we've been conditioning leaders to think that leadership is about um, uh, telling people to follow the rules. Yeah. And we've got to move on from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can tell you for a fact with uh, two kids under eight, um, telling mm -hmm. them that they've got to follow the rules doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, my kid, my kids are grown up now, but uh, yeah, absolutely the same. Is I, I'm thinking, oh, okay, well, so you know, something happens. I go, okay, well, so what? What led them to do it that way? It's always what I'm thinking. What you know, what what caused, what made, what was the context that influenced their behaviour? And that's what I'm always thinking <laughs> when yeah. my kids do stuff that is unexpected. Yeah. Or I go, oh, okay. And and if so, for example, my son broke um, a bowl over Christmas. And uh, he came straight to me and told me he dropped this bowl. Mm. I went, thank you so much. Thank you for telling me. Because now what I can do is I can clean it up. We can clean it up properly. And nobody's going to get a piece of china in their foot. Yeah. Thank you. Instead of saying, oh, my God, you've broken my bowl. How yeah. could you? Yeah. Because, because, then it, because then I know now he's going to always tell me mm. about if something's gone wrong because it, it yeah. i'm gonna help him right Fit yeah yeah and it's interesting how you can draw those parallels isn't it isn't it between um raising children and and, and approaching things and actually running a business and leading other other people in in, in your work life because yeah you're, you're quite right that kind of confrontational uh, anger is only going to roll them up and uh and ends up in in an argument and and, and and hurt feelings and and that's not constructive is it whereas actually you know accepting that accidents happen and you know um if, if my kids you know drew all over my all over the walls i'd be i'd probably be a bit annoyed um but if they dropped a bowl and broke it then that's an accident and you know you deal with that in a different way and if they if, um, my kids did draw all over a wall and i thought right so that's down to me because i gave him at two years old access to some pens and didn't yeah. supervise him yeah. So what did I expect was going to happen? Mm. He didn't have any paper. So, and that's the thing about in the workplace, you know, we, we should, should be thinking that we're all part of a family, right? So rather than thinking about parent-child, we're thinking um, kind of cousins. Yeah. Uh, and that that we're looking out for each other and that we're treating each other like we're, we're family with respect. And that that does make a big difference. I mean, that's why small companies do so well when it comes to safety performance is because there's this family feeling where yeah. th the, th this level of blame about, oh, you know, Bob's done that thing wrong. How could he? Instead, they go, oh, well, you know, uh, well, I understand the, the difficulties that, that Bob has been dealing with in this particular piece of work. And so I'm not going to jump to blame instead I'm going to understand and we're going to work it out. Hmm. And so I think that, you know, this feeling of family, I think is a, a very important one because we are, um, you know, each other's keeper hmm. when it comes to identifying risk, but also speaking out about any issues that we're encountering. Yeah. I, I find that that definitely to be true from the perspective of trying to sort of influence people's behavior at, at work in terms of safety. So if you if you read um, any books about sales or marketing for example they'll tell you that everybody's inherently selfish and it's all about what's in it for them and what's the personal gain so if you're trying to sell you know a product or a service to a to a company um you need to think about who the decision maker is and then what's in it for them what's their personal gain and try to yes you've got to tick the boxes for the company but you've also got to tick the boxes for that individual whereas my experience with things um around safety is that actually Saying to somebody, this is in your interest because it's going to keep you safe doesn't really resonate um, as much as you're doing it because this will help keep your friend Bob mm. uh, safe. Yeah. And that seems to sort of uh, turn a light bulb on in, in people's heads a lot more than because I think people, it's a bit like, um, you know, if you do a survey of who's a good driver and 75% or whatever say they're a good driver, clearly they're above, above average drivers. Well, clearly they're not. I think people expect, don't expect bad things to happen to them, do they? Um, no. But they can see that they wouldn't want a bad thing to happen to somebody that they, that they know and they, and they like, or they love that's close to them. And it, it, it feeds, it feeds into people's sense of purpose. So 
um, there, there's this idea, and it's around a, a, a in, tra in transformational leader about um, a higher goal, something that's higher than yourself. And so this this purpose of looking after others and helping others in the workplace feeds right into that. That you your purpose is to to do good things and to help people, and rather than something selfishly for yourself. And so mm. that that kind of fits very well. It's a bit like when you think about um, reward programs and why they don't work. Yeah, it's but, but, you know, it part of it is because the reward is so long after um, the. Uh, the, the the like if it's an annual reward scheme, but another reason, and I'm we're just about to publish a paper on this in Safety Science also, uh, not published yet, is that when it comes to safety, people feel that that it it kind of under undermines the value of safety by giving rewards for it, and in the aviation industry, they have decoupled um, rewards like annual cash bonus from safety performance, because they, they said it, it certainly did um, make, it, it just didn't feel right mm. to link safety to, it, it took, devalued it. So uh, this idea of um, a, 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 the goal being a higher purpose for oneself and, um, he, and helping people, I think that does make a, a kind of a, a big difference mm. um, in terms of how how people feel um, valued themselves when they come to work yeah. because they're because they're doing something for everybody. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. I look forward to reading that because um, I often have conversations with companies about uh, insurance claims in my in my sort of field. Yes, and and you know the, again, I think this is probably a sign of the culture being wrong. Uh, the more we talk about this but it's kind of um the 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 leisure club manager or the pub manager or the whatever um has underspent on their cleaning budget to try to pad up the PL and and that's resulted in higher risk and then somebody slipped and hurt themselves and there's a claim um and it's the question of well should that be in some way hitting their PL so that there's a there's a sort of a, a stick approach um or, or not and and yeah it's it's making this conversation is actually making me think differently about that question as to whether that should or shouldn't be the case so yeah it's very interesting well by doing that what actually happens is it causes underreporting. Hmm. so um it, it a, a pretty high proportion of people that we spoke to in this study uh said that um their perception was that given uh, linking safety output data to uh, to reward annual cash reward uh, could make it less likely for people to report. Mm. Um, and so, if that happens in a fitness club, then somebody reporting the slip um, means that it, it might get d classified as less mm. as less severe. Um, and I, I do know of one case of a company where because they haven't got a particularly strong reporting system, the way they actually find out about incidents is through looking at the insurance claim data. Mm -hmm. Now, that is a terrible place to be in. And this company, of course, is working on it um, to try and improve their situation. But it, uh, but, but, you, you know, there is always, often a, a big difference between the level of reporting in a, in a company and the actual level of incidents and I think I think in the UK data when they do phone data on uh, phone surveys on this and look at, at the actual number of incidents reported mm. and then they phone up that thousands of people and they find out that there's probably about half the level of incidents that are reported yeah. than actually there are yeah um yeah so yes yeah. so it's uh, twice as many incidents mm. there are so yeah. that's a a, a a big issue there that using the stick approach re, re, or this linkage between bonus and safety causes it to go underground and, and the saddest thing about it um is that by doing that linkage 
it looks like it works. Mm. Like it feels like it works. But imagine a company has, let's say, 20 incidents a year. And then the following year, the target is 18. And the following year, it's 16. And the following yeah. year, it's 14. And the 14, and eight, down to 10. <laughs> and, and then the, the, the safety committee or the pay committee looks at this and reward committee and goes, oh, it's amazing. You know, you know, it's this. It's working out so well for us because the number of incidents are going down. No, the number of incidents are not going down. The level of reporting is going down. Mm. But it, and so that's why it, these um, policies are so seductive because they look as if they're working when mm. in reality they're causing even worse things to happen because it the incidents are being hidden yeah. which means they're not being mm. addressed addressed and mm. therefore even more severe incidents can happen mm. i suppose the ideal scenario is that and i don't know how you how it's workable but you need to get the people focusing on the inputs and doing the right inputs and tracking those inputs and ensuring the inputs are done um and then rewarding them potentially based on doing the right inputs rather than uh, hitting them with a bad output as in an accident, because accidents can happen, as we've said, um, and, and actually they could be doing everything right in the inputs and still something bad happens. Whereas if they're not doing everything right in the inputs, then that's a problem that we need to try to address sort of upstream rather than waiting until that's flagged up by by the output of, a, of, a, of an incident and, a, and an injury and a claim. Well, I myself, plus a lot of people I know, have worked on that, on working on the quality of inputs. Um, what we find is that if we link it to any sort of bonus, it, oh, all the, the quality of inputs becomes perfect. <laughs> you know, it's, everything's fine. There's nothing wrong. And so and we say, well, well, actually, we're looking for variability and and but but it's very, very difficult to link any sort of link leading indicator to reward because mm. it corrupts the leading indicator. Mm. So I would say, yes, the quality of inputs, um, you know, the quality of planning, the quality of task risk assessments at the point of work, the quality of toolbox talks, the, those we know when we look at incident investigations, we know that those are important things to get the quality right on. Mm. Um, but if we then link those to any sort of reward or any, or even any sort of kind of people getting called out for having poor quality planning, for example, it um, distorts the metric straight mm. away. So, so that's the issue with leading indicators is that, they're quite easily distorted if a company uses them for, in, for measurement rather yeah. than learning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and they're also, we have to be very careful about having a cottage industry of, of these in leading indicators because um, they just make a huge amount of extra work for people. Mm -hmm. I, I have to say I've, got to a point where um, I'm thinking that you know lead, leading indicators on quality of two or three things that are really important to a company are helpful yeah. and not to have a big dashboard of them because that's an industry of, of measurement and then looking at these annual general surveys that most companies run um, for seeing how improvement or deterioration is happening over time. Uh, and obviously it has to be done by site yep. or, you know, by warehouse or what, whether it's, you know, a hundred people were units of a, about a hundred people. Mm -hmm. And that's a really powerful way of uh, seeing what's going on in a company. Uh, obviously not linking it to bonus as well. Because again, as soon as people think that this annual survey that they fill out with without a second thought and they do it every year and yeah. nothing ever seems to come from it, 
uh, as soon as they find out that that's going to be linked to bonus well uh, or as soon as it said that it's yeah. going to be linked to bonus well all of a sudden the survey results will become yeah you know 100 percent. everything's wonderful mm. yeah yeah makes sense makes sense well, uh, Diane, thank you so much for your time. I've really, really enjoyed this this conversation. Before uh, we wrap up, though, um, just wanted to give you the opportunity to uh, explain a bit more about, you know, what what you're doing, and if if some of this stuff has resonated with people and they're interested to uh, to work with you or learn more about how you could help them. I mean, how they could get in touch with you, and and and, and then if you've got anything you wanted to plug, any articles or books or websites or anything like that, then the the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Well, I, 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 I've got to say, I, now that I'm retired, I really do enjoy volunteering, and um, I, I, you know, I am open to people who are trying to implement the hop approach, for them to to speak with me and see if they'd be interested in, in me mentoring them. Um, but I would say that whatever um, difficulty that you're encountering in your company in terms of a lack of understanding of work as imagined versus work as done, that I, I've, I've seen massive transformation happening in companies, which um, because there's a critical mass of understanding on this. And this has obviously been going on since the 1940s in aviation and the 1970s in nuclear. So this is nothing new. We're just taking the learnings from nuclear and from aviation and bringing it into different industries. And so I think people worry about credibility um, and validity of this approach. And I would say, don't worry about that. So those are just my final thoughts. Good stuff. And where, um, what's the best place for people to reach out to you? Is it LinkedIn or yeah, the website? Or just send, connect with me on LinkedIn and and send me a note, and I'll Good be stuff. happy to chat. Good stuff. All right. Well, thank you very much, Diane. Uh, really enjoyed it. Much appreciated. And um, thanks everybody for joining us. And we'll see you again next week with another interview. Thanks for joining us on the Safety and Risk Success Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please hit follow and do share on social media. Does anyone you know spring to mind as a great guest, even yourself? If so, please contact us on podcast at slipsafety.co.uk. See you next week for another episode.